This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, hello and a very special warm welcome to the Windsor Woods Elementary, the Tree Trops Primary Academy and the Hampton Oaks Elementary. Welcome aboard uh, with us here in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. We're out on foot and we are just watching a very pretty bird up there. That one is called a purple roller and he's actually just flown down onto the ground and caught himself an insect and I think you just missed him having his lunch but I'm sure he might be a little bit hungry as well so he he might still go down and catch something else but what I want you to do kids is to think of all your questions and to send us them through your teacher because we want to know what you want to know about the African bush because I'm going to be walking around this afternoon and trying to find all sorts of little interesting things and my name is Ralph and on the camera today I've got Fergus helping me to find all the animals as well now it's going to be very exciting because I'm gonna go on foot and I'm gonna see if I can get close to a leopard but I'm not gonna promise anything because this is not a zoo and so we are going to just try our best now that's not the only big animal out here we've got lions and elephants and even buffalo and speaking of buffalo let's go and have a look A very, very good afternoon. My name is Sydney. I am traveling with Senzo. We are going to be with you on this drive. At this stage, I have got some buffaloes here, very much relaxed, not doing anything. You can see it is this time of the day where you find buffaloes very much relaxed. Shortly, they will have to wake up here and all move to the grazing area. Buffaloes, they walk every time in large numbers and this gives them at least much more advantage to defend themselves when it comes to the predators predators i am talking about the animals that hunt other animals for feeding purposes yeah some of them are just playing chasing each other but not much is happening. I can see that they are in a very uh, comfortable mood. So you can see that they are not grazing at, the, at this moment. So maybe they just got here not long time ago. Uh, Caitlin, the the buffaloes, you can see they can walk in a very big numbers. They are very much gregorious, meaning that they walk in big numbers. Uh, sometimes you can find two to four males walking by themselves, and some of the males they prefer to walk just by themselves. But the breeding head, the head which is consisted of the females and the young, and also the young males this is where you will find a lot the biggest head i have seen it was over 250 buffaloes in kruger national park some years ago they were all just crossing the road right in front of me so they can travel in very big groups so buffaloes and uh, some of the birds such as the oxpeckers they are very good friends before you see the buffaloes in that area, you will see those kind of birds just flying up on, in the sky. When seeing those kind of birds, you must know there is something. Not necessarily the buffalo, but these kind of birds, they prefer to walk around with the buffaloes. What they are doing there now is they are cleaning these animals. Is the ones who are responsible of catching the leaves. Look at how that one is holding. So these birds can't fall from these animals.
Uh, Lily, the buffalo horns can be very much big. They can be very wide, up to 100 to 150 centimeters. So the males, the horns are much thinner. The, the, the females' horns are much thinner. And for the males, they are very much broad. And you can see that join, they are joined together. Here you can see that area is called the boss. Look at that. Beautiful, eh? There is one looking at us. And that is quite a very big horn. Look at that. So sometimes you will see them pushing each other uh, during the daytime. When they're pushing each other is when they're trying just to communicate about the, the level of, uh, of, of dominance, the level of, uh, of positions in the head. So now we can go to Ralph and see what the Hornbills are doing on his side. Well, and what Sydney said is a hornbill is that little bird that's hopping around there. And if you've watched The Lion King, you would have known that Zazu, the little bird that is Simba's right-hand man, is a little hornbill himself. But this one is Zazu's cousin, because Zazu had a yellow bill, and this one's got a red bill. So this is a red billed hornbill, Zazu's cousin. But we'll just call him Zazu. Why don't we do that? And look what he's doing. He's jumping around. He's looking for little insects. And he was also looking inside the elephant poo because lots of insects like to go inside the elephant poo. But look how he's jumping around and grabbing things with his bill. And it looks like he's got pajamas on, doesn't it? But he's going around the corner a little bit there. I hope that Fergus can still see him. You see how he's jumping? He normally flies around a little bit clumsily, but he also jumps around a bit clumsily. He's a little bit funny, isn't he? But, well, he's now gone behind that termite mound, and maybe he's a little bit camera shy. He doesn't like being in front of the camera, hey? Oh, there he is. He's coming out the other side, but... It's not very easy for Fergus because it's quite far away from us and we can't get any closer than this because he'll fly away. So we just want to stay nice and far away from him so that he doesn't get nervous of us. There he comes, just off the side of that termite mound, and it looks like he's very hungry because he's really working hard and jumping around on the ground and looking for all sorts of little insects. And hornbills will eat all sorts of things, from insects to seeds and berries. But they are very funny, aren't they? Now, Jordan, a, a hornbill can fly pretty far, but he can't fly as far as a swallow, because swallows, they fly halfway around the world every single year. But these hornbills, they'll stay here in the Kruger National Park all the year, so they just fly from tree to tree, or from elephant dung to elephant dung. So they don't fly too far, and they're a little bit lazy flyers, not like the swallows that can fly very, very, very far, and they fly very high as well. A hornbill doesn't fly very high, maybe only as high as the tree tops. That's about all. And, but, well, it looks like he's disappearing off there in the grass a bit, still looking for all sorts of insects and things. But, well, while we leave him to catch his little insects and things, let's go back to Sydney with those massive animals. Yeah, all the buffaloes are very much relaxed and lying down right on the road. So the question is, why only deciding to lie on the road whereas there are grasses somewhere nearby? So what I have realized here now is that these animals, they are lying in the middle of the road in order to get hold of some of the heat because when the sun is shining, it does heat the well-exposed areas such as the road. So they are trying to to follow some of this heat here on the ground. None of them is lying down on the grasses. So they're just all on the road. 
So I can see this kind of, of weather is cloudy a little bit and yes it's not that very warm it is cold at the moment not too much cold but maybe for them it's cold considering their color which is black and the black color absorbs heat and it doesn't uh, reflect heat they're trying now to absorb maybe the heat from from the soil Yes, I've got a question from Annabelle. The buffaloes, they normally go to sleep between half past eight and nine in the morning. And then they go and hide. Mostly they prefer to hide by the big uh, dry river beds. And also they go and lie in the deep, uh, thick, thick, thick bushes. So that is where they prefer to hide. Now at about half past three, four o'clock that is when they're going to be active again and start looking for some grazing areas at night you'll see them feeding so if you can check there now some of them Uh, the question from Ella, the markings on their faces is not from their horns. These animals, they have got to uh, walk in between the trees and there's quite a lot of sticks and thorny and hook thorns which does catch these animals as they are walking around. Yes, some of them, they lose the skin there when pushing each other, when they are fighting, real fight, also when they are playing around. So that can also tell you, you can easily estimate the age of an animal. You can see that that animal must be very old by now. They can survive and they can survive close to 20 to 23 years. So now let's go to Steve. Steve has got some hippos to show you on the other side. Yes, well, good afternoon, boys and girls, and welcome to my end of the safari. And we have come down to Chitwa Watering Hole, where we have found some marvelous hippos. And my name is Steve. I'm joined on camera by Davisito. And uh, look at what we've got over there. Very, very interesting. Lots of hippos sitting outside of the water. And like with Sydney's buffalo, there are lots and lots of ox peckers on top of them as well, feeding on the ticks and whatever blood there might be because hippos get lots of scratches when they walk around in the bush there's lots of thorns out here and sometimes lions even try and have a go at a hippo and also they fight can you see those teeth they bite each other and they're very bumpy and shovy in the water and so the ox pickers like to feed on the blood that's coming out and it's very very cool and there is a little baby He's being protected by mum, trying not to get too squashed in amongst all the masses of hippos that are here out in the, sort of out in the open, enjoying a little bit of the afternoon because it's probably very cold in the water. And um, if you'd like to, uh, Lou, we can maybe have a look at the thermal camera. We've got a very cool camera that we sometimes look at and we're going to cut to it now and look at that. Those are the hippos. That's the heat that they are giving off. Isn't that marvelous? And look at that hippo in the middle of the screen. You can see how half of his body is purple and the top is orange. That's because he is probably sitting in the water for a very long time. And if I look at him normally, there is actually a line of water on his body. So the water cooled him down a lot. And so the outside of his skin is showing a lot cooler than the top where you see all the other hippos on the bank. They're all very, very orange and that is that is what they do to keep warm they sit in the sunshine and when they get cold they go into the water similar to what we can do but they are masters at it they're almost behaving like a crocodile by doing that using the sun to warm them up and the water to cool them down <coughs> excuse me Hello, Nicola. You want to know how fast hippos can run? And they can run at about 
20 miles an hour, about 40 kilometers an hour. That's pretty fast for an animal that can weigh three to 4,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds, some of them. It's a very, very fast, and generally when they're running, it's downhill, so they're going even faster than that. You don't want to get in their way. They'll just squash you with their big feet and their big round bodies. You see the little babies there on the edge? They don't want to go in. They're enjoying being out in the warmth. It's not a very warm day here today, but it's definitely warmer out of the water than in the water. Hello, Tyler. You want to know how long can hippos stay underwater? Well, apparently they can hold their breath for about six minutes. Um, I've never stood and timed before. I've always lost focus and then forgotten I was timing. But someone has spent six minutes watching them. But I've even heard stories of up to nine minutes. So I suppose it really depends on the time and on the day and on the hippo. Oh, a little... Egyptian goose landed here and gave the hippos a little bit of a fright. There we go. Ooh, hello. A little bit of argy-bargy happening over here. Can you see his one side is a lot cooler? Well, you can't see it now, but his one side was a lot cooler than the other side. He was probably lying in the mud, opposite side to where the sun was setting. If we go back to the thermal quickly, you will see what I mean. He's been lying flat on his side. That hippo is standing on the sort of the middle of the screen. See how purple the body is? And the head and the back is very pink or orange. And that's because the sun was on the other side. But something's going on with these hippos. I don't quite know what it is. They don't feel very comfortable outside the water. And even when some birds came and landed, it gave them all a little bit of a fright. They are such funny looking animals, aren't they? In the middle of the screen, you can see there's a couple of birds. There's an Egyptian goose, the one with his head in the water. He's busy trying to get any sort of organic plant material in the water to feed on. And then those black and white birds are looking for any insects that might be sort of floating around the edge of the water. There you can see there's at least two of them. So lots and lots of activity around the hippos because they bring lots of food down to the water in the, in the form of their poo. Mr. Jowski, you want to know what might eat hippos? Well, lions are known to kill hippos and eat them. Um, and if hippos die in the water because of natural death or through fighting, then crocodiles, by all means, will have a very good go. Um, the youngsters, like that one you can see in the middle, they are very prone to being killed by lion. Uh, big ones, generally not so much. But then hippos do kill each other quite a lot. Big male hippos will fight for territory, and that's probably the biggest reason or cause of their death. Um, but if they are unaware and not paying attention, youngsters out in the wilderness at night can get caught by lions. And even hyena. I think there was a, a bit of a sighting up in the Mara recently with some of our friends with hyenas trying to corner a, a hippo. I'm not sure how that ended. But they are very powerful animals, very short, stubby legs. And the objective for the lions would be to get them on their back. And that's a very hard thing to do. I once watched 20 lions trying to kill a hippo. And they were all jumping on its back. And eventually the, the hippo turned around and caught one of them on the head with its mouth. And picked it up like a rag doll and threw it about 20 to 30 yards away. Luckily that lion survived, but the rest of the lions decided, well, this isn't fun, and they left it alone. So a big adult female, adult male hippo aren't really too much of a problem, but the youngsters are the ones that lions might try and pick off. Other than that, though, nothing else really tries to mess with them. Every now and again, in drought conditions, when we get very little rain and the water goes down, that can be the biggest killer of hippos is the lack of water because they need water to keep their skin moist and that is where they live. Well, fantastic. Lovely to see the hippos this afternoon. We're going to go back over to Ralph Kirsten who's found a very common bird. Well, yes, and look at this very pretty bird here that we found 
also walking along the ground and I'm just following him because he's not very scared of me and what he's doing is a little bit similar to what that hornbill was doing, the one that we call Zazu, but this one is a little bit more like a chicken and this is called a Crested Franklin. And why is he called a Crested Franklin? Because he can put his feathers up on his head that it makes him look like he's got a little hat. But he's not doing it at the moment because he's just looking for food. And so he's scrounging around much like a chicken would at your home. And I'm just following him slowly and I'm looking at him with my binoculars as well. And I can see that he's got lots of white bands on him as well as very red legs. But he's going now a little bit into the bushes there. So he's hiding himself. Maybe he doesn't want me to see him anymore. But where are you going, little Franklin? Now, he much like the pheasants that you might get in England or in America as well. So, and he's now disappearing a little bit off in there. I wonder if we can see him a little bit better. But I also use my binoculars, which helps me see very far. Looks like he's coming out again. Let me check with my binoculars. Oh, yes, there he comes. And you see he's a little bit orangey red around the neck as well. But look at those very red legs that he has. Wow. He's a very cute little bird, isn't he? Now, Mrs. Miller, it's 21 degrees uh, Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a nice, cool winter's day. There's a little bit of clouds around, so the sun isn't getting us. Um, and it has been a little bit rainy the last few days because we've had a bit of a cold front that has moved through. So that means that it gets even more cold than it would uh, normally. It's much as if you get a, a like a snowstorm, but for us in Africa, we don't really get much snow, um, but it doesn't change the behavior of the animals too much, except that when it's cold, the animals can move around a little bit more, because when it's very hot, it does make them very tired, because they have to uh, expend a lot of energy to keep cool. Now, he's still just walking around like a chicken. He's kicking his feet out a bit, and there he is. He's just walking now back out into the open. And you know what I want you all kiddies to do? The next time you're watching Safari Live, I want to see you all with your binoculars. And you know how you make a pair of binoculars? You take two old toilet rolls, the cardboard inside, and you glue those together and you make little holes on the outside and you put a piece of string so that you can put it over your head and then when you watch Safari Live, you can look with your binoculars just like me okay so on the next show i want to see you all with your binoculars so that you can help me look for the little birds there he is let's use our binoculars you can also use your hands and just make two rings and look through your binoculars let's look for the bird there he is still just being like a little chicken Elissa, this little bird can run faster than I would be able to run. If I had to try and chase him, I'll never catch him. So he can run faster than me, and I can run pretty fast. But uh, this little guy is um, quite fast in that he can also get away from some of the predators here and the little cats that might want to have him for dinner. So he does need to be quite fast. And I would say he can probably run as fast as you can ride on your bicycle. The fastest you can ride on your bicycle, that's as fast as he can run. So he's pretty fast. And all the animals out here run faster than we can. Even Hussein Bolt won't be able to run as fast as that little guy. And that's the fastest man in the world. Now, that little bird seems to be carrying on with his uh, search for food, and I think I need to continue on the search for leopards. Well, good luck, Ralph. I hope you do find a leopard. We're also going to be going and looking for a leopard. We moved off from um, from the watching hole in the hippos because we saw something on our way 
to the watering hole that we thought we'd come back to and show you. Are you ready for the largest land mammal in the world? Are you ready? Yes? It's that one with the really long nose. Here's one just here on the left. I'm going to move a little bit further forward and get him in the open. There we go. Look at that. Boys and girls, here is an African elephant. It's a young male who's on his own. There's more. We saw more before. They're a little bit further on. We might catch up with them. He's only a youngster. This is probably about 18, maybe 20 years of age. So he's still very small as far as elephants go. You see him busy chewing. But his eyes are almost closed, which is a good indication that he's quite relaxed. There he's using his very long nose. Don't know what he's feeding on right now. It almost feels like he's feeding on some fruits. But let's see what he picks up. He's able to use that. There we go. He's got some sticks. This time of year, the elephants like to feed on bark. The bark is that, that covering on the outside of the trees with lots of moisture and lots of nutrients inside. Let me move up a little bit more, Darvi, and we might get him feeding. They are very selective in their feeding. They feed on everything. They feed on the roots, the leaves, the, the sticks, the fruits, and even grass. There we go. You can see him feeding now. He's putting the stick. Layla, you want to know how big their ears are? Well, the size of the ears, the front and the back of both of the ears, work out to be about 30% of the actual size of the elephant, the skin covering. So how big they are exactly? Probably about a meter and a half, a meter across at the longest part, I would say. But they work as a very, very cool technique for cooling themselves down and once again Lou if we can go to the thermal we'll have a look at how this very big animal uses his ears to cool down look how warm his body is he's got a huge warm body and look at the ears because the, the skin is quite thin on the ears and there's lots of blood networks coming into the ear and when he flaps it the more flapping he does, the more heat he loses, and so the more he cools down. Um, right now, it's not a very hot day, so he's got his ears close to the body, because inside and underneath, the skin is very, very thin there. Probably as thin as the skin behind our ears. Very soft. Can you feel the back of your ears now? Very soft. And inside there, they've got lots of blood that's moving through. And that is what's actually cooling them down. So if he flaps them, it gives them lots and lots of warmth. But you can see how blue the ears are now, can't you? The tips of them. There we go. Look underneath. You can kind of see how warm it is in there. Because he's not that cold, he's holding his ears flat against the body so that he can not give off any heat. Just like we do when we're a little bit cold, what do we do? We take our arms and we stick them into our armpits, don't we? Or sometimes we stick our hands and we put them down between our legs to keep ourselves warm because those are the parts of our body that we're giving off a lot of heat. Very warm in the armpit. And the elephant, you can kind of think of his ear behind the ear there like an armpit okay well there we go from a very orange elephant back to the giant gray animal that he is he's slowly moving away probably going to follow the rest of the herd there were more elephants in the distance we saw earlier he's gonna try to follow them because he feels very lonely Jack you want to know how long their trunks are well you know from the, the, the ground up an elephant can stand from shoulder height probably about four meters so about 12 feet or so so I would say his trunk is just over yeah, you know, about half of that maybe maybe six feet just less than six feet long and they use it for everything they use it for feeding you see he's busy grabbing that branch there and he's sticking it into his mouth there we go, he's ripping off the leaves. 
He's kicking it with his foot. And then they also suck up lots of water into their nose, which they then push back into their mouth like an enormous straw. He's got a little bit of takeaway food. I don't know if you can see, there's a little bird following them. Oh, he's disappeared. There's a little bird following him. He's very brave following an enormous animal like that. Well, as this elephant moves off, I think we might be able to come around onto another road that's going that way and see if we can catch up with the rest of the herd because that's the direction we want to go to to follow up on a leopard that was seen earlier today. Very exciting afternoon. You've seen the hippos now. You've seen an elephant. I hope you're keeping a list of all the wonderful animals that we're showing you. Don't forget the birds as well. And Ralph has gone and found another animal for your list. And this one is one of the favorites from the Lion King. Well, yes, look what we've found. These are wildebeest. Now, they also are on the Lion King. Remember when they all stampede down the canyon and that's when the little cub gets caught in the way. Well, these guys aren't stampeding. They're all watching us and there are actually a couple of them also rolling around in the sand. They do like rolling around in the sand. I don't know if you can see them from there, but uh, they're very much like zebra who also like rolling around. And I'll just show Ferg exactly where. There, Ferg. There we go. But they are very strange looking animals, aren't they? They've all got horns and they use that to protect themselves against the lions because that is um, the only way that they can look after themselves. And the lions have claws and big teeth, but what the wildebeest have is a pair of horns. So they use that to try and defend themselves. But these guys are just very relaxed now. They're not doing too much. Looks like they are quite enjoying themselves, eh? Hey? And they're quite hairy, and they've got quite a big mane. That's what you call that long hair around their neck. That's called a mane. And that's like what a horse would have as well on the top of its head. Now, sincere, wildebeest don't really attack other animals uh, because they all gang up together and try and look after themselves against the lions. So you might have zebra and impala and some of the other animals all uh, walking together and they don't really fight with each other. The only ones that they fight with are the lions because the lions try to eat them. so But the lions also need to eat. So, um, well, that's just the great circle of life, isn't it? But these ones aren't getting eaten at the moment, luckily. And they're quite relaxed. They're just looking at us, thinking, what are those strange things? All right, so... Hopefully these wildebeest aren't going to be got by the lions, but I hear that somebody has found some lions. I have got quite a, a very a beautiful sighting here of the uh, Talamati pride. It's one of the uh, prides uh, in the area. We are right on the western side of the Juma Game Reserve. And they are very much relaxed. There's quite a few of them here. You can see one of them trying to uh, clean herself there. This is what they do, the lions, when they're dating. So they use the tongue in order to clean themselves. You can see it's quite a few of them. I'm not too sure how many uh, they are in this area. But I've seen, I think, four to five. So the lions, the... Uh, Diana, the animals don't get that very cold. If you can check animals such as the uh, herbivores, they spend their all day long feeding because they try to get energy. 
the food they are eating every day for long hours is the energy they are trying to have in order to survive against the cold. So lions, cats, mostly they do their activities when the temperatures are cool. So the lions get excited during these kind of temperatures. So normally by this time of the day, lions are sleeping completely flat. But I can see some of them are even more active, whereas some are still sleeping. So we are lucky to find that some of them are just relaxed with their heads up. These animals can sleep for about approximately 18 hours. So they do most of their activities early in the mornings and late afternoons. So you can see the tip of the ears are black there. So those black tips, they help when they are walking around with their babies. That is when they use those, t those ears, tip of the ears, as a follow me sign in order to show their little ones we are going to this direction. So they call their little ones and little ones they follow the tip of their ears. The question from uh, Diana, the, the males, I haven't seen them. I'm trying to check here and I haven't spotted any of the males. But when it comes to the animals such as the lions, it's normal. The females, they walk in prides. A pride is just a group of lions consisted of the uh, females together with their little ones. Males, they tend to form their own group. It is called a coalition. So we don't have it here. Coalition is just a group of males. Uh, Lily, the lions can grow very big and they can weigh up to 170, 190 kilograms. That is quite a very big cat. You can see the size of the head. This animal is big. It's one of the biggest cats. The males, when, when they're standing, you will see they are very much big. So these females, they are the ones which are responsible to bring food. So they go out and look for some food and then they supply to their little ones. Even the males depend on these females. So now, while still enjoying the uh, lion sighting, we can now go to Steve and see what the elephants are doing on the other side. Yes, well, well done, Sydney. You've managed to find another of the big animals. We have come around and found the rest of the herd. And here is a few females with a youngster in the front. And that female there, you see her flapping her ears now. She was actually asleep. They fall asleep on their feet, elephants. If they're not eating and they're not drinking or walking, uh, they have a little nap. And they don't often lie down when they sleep. They often stand up like a horse and just kind of nod off for a few minutes. And her youngster, probably her, her son in front of her there, is looking for a little bit of attention. We all do that, don't we? Mom and Dad want to have a little nap and now it's time we want to play. He's going to come play with us now. He's got himself a stick. Look at that. I've got myself a stick. Mom's awake now. He's going to come and show us how big and strong he is. There we go. It's probably about a five-year-old, that one. Five or six years of age, judging by the size. And there you can see Mum is busy digging. She's woken up and she feels like she needs a snack of roots. And she's using her foot to dig into the bushes there. And look how that youngster is learning. The youngster is watching and seeing exactly what mum is doing and learning, okay, if I do this with my foot, 
I'm going to be able to get something from inside of there, and then I can use my trunk or even my tusks. Reese, you want to know why they have tusks? Well, the tusks are used for for digging into the tree and then ripping off the bark. Um, sometimes they can even take a branch and sort of hold it over the tusk and then break it with the tusk. So the tusk is very useful in allowing them to eat. Um, and the males, the big males, they actually use their tusks for fighting. So not only do they use it for stripping the bark off of trees and breaking branches, they also use it to compete with other big males for the breeding rights to the females. So this little youngster, not that little, is learning from mum. They are very smart. Oh, did you hear that? Mum is saying, no, not now. I don't want to give you attention now. I'm hungry. Alex, not all elephants have tusks. Some of them are born without tusks. That's kind of like a genetic thing. Some of them are just have and some don't but most elephants do have tusks but it's one of those things that happen every now and again uh, where they just don't develop them there she is where are you going mama she's woken up and she's realized how hungry she is she's going to show you what a bulldozer she is look at that she's pushing the whole bush over she wants to get at the roots these trees they take lots of their their, their best bits, all of their good stuff, into the ground, underneath the soil, to hide away from all sorts of animals. And she knows it. You can't hide away from an elephant. They are very big, very strong. And if they want to eat something, they're going to get at it. Very, very cool. There we go, look at her, look how she's smashing it down with her head. Jordan, you want to know how they can protect themselves? Well, have a look at her. She's taking that small tree and she's just squashing it with her face. Elephants are very big, they can get up to 13,000 pounds. The big males, uh, the females not as big as that, but you know, even that lion you saw there, they will never get more than 400, maybe 500 pounds, never ever. So elephants are far bigger than they are. So what they'll do is they can chase things, they can squash things, they can hit them with their trunk, they can kick them, they can stab them with their tusks. There's lots of things that elephants can do to defend themselves. But one of the most thing, one of the biggest things that they do is they just make themselves look very, very big. They spread out their ears spread out their ears like this and they stand up very tall and everyone gets very scared and runs away they try to do it to us sometimes but it's very important not to run away because if you run away it becomes a game to the elephant and then they want to chase you you don't want to be chased by an elephant because they can run at about 24 23 24 miles an hour and they don't have to run around the bushes and the trees they just run over them But if you ever come out on safari, your safari guide will tell you exactly what to do and what not to do with elephants. They are the biggest of the animals, so it's very important that you understand how to behave around them. Like right now, we're giving them lots of space. We don't want to go in there and, and disturb their, break, their, their dinner or their breakfast. You did have a little nap, their afternoon tea. Let them have space. And if you don't sort of bother them and you don't chase their youngsters around, elephants can be very pleasant. They don't feed on meat, you see, so they're only feeding on leaves and branches. So essentially, if you leave them alone, they will leave you alone. Tommy, yes, they only eat vegetation, so seeds and fruits um, and branches and leaves and grass. So very vegetarian diet. Uh, every now and again they might eat a little bit of soil just to get some nutrients in that they are missing. And every now and again it's actually quite funny to see. But if you look in the road over here, Darby, we look at one of those, those dung piles. And you see one of those balls in the road? That is an elephant dropping. And every now and again the youngsters will eat that because it gives them all sorts of things inside their tummy which helps them then to digest the food that they eat so that is one of the things they eat but that's still vegetation as well but there's lots of little good things in there that help them with their feeding and their eating
thank you very much to all the schools who joined us this afternoon. We've managed to show you some of the best and biggest of the animals out here in the savannah. I hope we get to see you again soon. Please do come back. Have a beautiful day, and we'll catch up with you soon. And while we say goodbye to you, we're going to be going back over to Ralph, who's trying to catch up with the little chief. Yes, well, I am trying to catch up with the little chief, but obviously we always uh, stop for everything else in between. And um, I just want to welcome back all the regular viewers. Um, and uh, I also want to remind you to please send your questions and your comments to the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat as we're watching these magpie shrikes having a little tiff with a yellow-billed hornbill. I'm not sure what it is that they are having a bit of argy-bargy about, but um, nonetheless, it's always easy with the, the sort of blackbirds because there's not a, a large array of different blackbirds in the bush uh, here in South Africa. If we can think of them, uh, it would be the magpie shrike, uh, southern black tit, um, the fork-tailed drongo is also pure black. Um, the square-tailed drongo as well. Um, what else? Uh, the bigger one would be a black eagle or the Vero's eagle. What else are there? If you think of any other black birds, uh, maybe a red-winged starling is a little bit black with the, with that red on the on the wing. Um, Yes, thanks, Lou. She's saying the cuckoos. Um, uh, so if you think of any of black birds, send it to the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Uh, which are the other black birds? So we do have some of those. I think the classes cuckoo. No, he's got the green in him. Um, let's let's hear it from you guys. Which ones? There are. I know those those cuckoos, but you can tell me as well. Um, and so there's not too many black birds, and especially just with a little bit of white on it like that. Um, we know the southern black tit uh, is a little bit smaller also with the white on him. Um, so it's pretty easy to identify. But these guys got much longer tail than that of the southern black tit. And their call is quite different as well. Now, we're making our way towards Twin Dams. All right, Mafuta, you say the, the cuckoo shrike or the black cuckoo um uh, absolutely good one thanks mafuta yeah so what else which other ones ah angie you say penguin bobby you say crow yes absolutely well done guys uh penguin black they also got white on them but uh, we wouldn't find them in this kind of habitat but absolutely perfect um and there's a couple of other ones as well so send them in uh, to the hashtag safari live on twitter right i think i'm going to continue on we are trying to look for hosana otherwise known as the little chief and we do know where he was this morning at twin Day just hiding in a thicket there so we're gonna go see if we can catch up with him if he hasn't moved if he has well we'll just have to practice our tracking and trailing then won't we so I think it's time for us to move on as these birds have moved on and so while we are searching for leopards let's head you on over to the lions A very, very good afternoon. I am Sydney. I am traveling with Ascenzo this afternoon. We are going to be with you on this drive. And for the questions and comments, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live, and also on YouTube chat stream. My plan for this afternoon is to look for the cats, but I'm lucky already. I've got some lions here with me. They seem to be very, very, very much um, relaxed. So far, I have only noticed the females. Uh, Raphael, the, lion, the distance between these lions and the buffalo head is quite very big. Uh, I can say, I can estimate about two, two and a half kilometers. So it's quite a distance. So, but the possibilities of these lions to go to that direction are very very high i'm just waiting to see if maybe they're gonna wake up now and show me what they're thinking but at this stage it's very very much difficult to uh, check their mood
So but if nothing is happening, if it's like this, I am going to live. Yeah, if uh, nothing is happening here, I am going to leave the sighting, go and look for something else and come back again afterwards. Because I know the cats, they can spend much of their time just lying down like this. 18 hours is a lot. And I don't know how many hours they have spent so far relaxing here. Yeah, indeed, it is a very good sighting. To me as well, this is very much exciting. Hey, Carla, I was trying to read these lions here. It's quite very difficult to check the exact number because there's just, I'm seeing about four at this stage, but the other ones are not clearly visible. I'm just seeing some signs, some ears hidden by the grasses. So I'm not too sure of the exact number. Maybe before we leave, we might be able to see if they change and try to reallocate from where they are and move. Because I can see now some of them are starting yawning and they are showing some signs. They are becoming active a little bit now. So now let's go to Steve and uh, find out what Steve is going to do now. Well, hello everybody. Yes, well, we have left the elephants and we are now on Cheetah Cut Line. There was some, apparently some shouts of some zebra coming from this area. I didn't hear them myself. We've got some tracks all over the road. Um, and very, we saw some zebra earlier down that way, but our plan is um, the Lepidus Tundi was found this morning on Torchwood. So we're going to head over there. Hopefully we can find her. Apparently she had some meat. So as we know, when Tani's got some food, um, often we can find her again. It's when she disappears or it doesn't have meat that she disappears. So we're going to see if we can get there. I'm going to take the next right in. I'm just driving quite slowly up here to see if I can hear or see anything of the, the alarm calls that I was directed towards. Nothing as of yet. We're going, to, we're going to go right here. This will take us directly towards Torchwood Lodge and then somewhere south. Just have to have a look on the map. Here we go. We're crossing into Torchwood. Woo! I haven't done this in ages. Just going to announce myself on the radio. Steve from Wild Earth crossing into Torchwood. Just happened. That just happened. That's only the third time I'm coming here. Uh, Tex, I'll have a look on the, the pin. I, I'm not 100% sure the road. I'll have another look now. I've got to correlate it with the pin and the map. But yeah, it's somewhere around Pump House Road. I'll have a look. So Texan is obviously keen from uh, Voyatella Lodge. He's going to be on his way soon. Hopefully we don't have any gremlins this afternoon. So far, so good. I don't know what's going on with the weather. There's this huge cloud cover that's pulled in this afternoon. Huge cloud cover. Dave's going to show you. But the nice thing about it is it's keeping it nice and sort of relatively warm. As soon as that cloud cover dissipates, there's been almost no solar radiation today. So as soon as the cloud cover dissipates, it's going to be with a capital B. <laughs> but don't worry, as you know, I've got enough layers to last me. Well, I hope I do anyway. Beautiful afternoon out in the African wilderness. What a day it's been so far. Lovely elephants. Sydney with some buffalo and the Talamati pride. I've yet to see them. I've yet to see them. And hopefully um, Ralph manages to, to relocate on Osana. So let's go over to him and have a listen. Well, I haven't been able to find Osana yet, everybody. But as we come through here, we can just see some animals through the bush over there. And that very characteristic white toilet bottom of a male waterbuck. 
Now it looks like they're walking a little bit through the bushes there. They are a little bit nervous of us here. So let's just see if we can maybe get to see them again. I don't know if we will, but we can always try. They are quite nervous because we're on two feet and we know that animals, uh, especially the antelope, are rather scared of us. Um, and when they see us, this very strange upright walking animal. But let's just see if we can get through the bushes here a little bit and get another little view on them. I think we might be lucky that they find this bush here a little bit safe for them as well. It's between us and them, but they might have moved off altogether. Let's just have a look. See, there they are. You can see their bums through here, but they're going to start disappearing off. There they are. That's it. And there's one female there as well. She's now looking at us. That's quite nice, isn't it? Okay, so we've got a nose, Fergie. If you come this way a little bit, you might see her a bit better. But uh, there she is, watching us, watching her. Well done, Ferg. It's not easy pointing that camera through the bushes here and getting it right on the end of the zoom. So... These cameramen have got some serious skills. And we've got a different set of skills. We are the guides and the cam ops definitely have their work cut out for them. Trying to get right in on these guys on a far distance like that as well. It's normally not easy. But as I say, you see the security of having this thicket between us and them does make them calm down a little bit. And they can feel safe now that uh, they can see us as well. You often see how uh, the antelope can really want to see what uh, what a predator is up to. And, and that's what they think of us as well, I would have to say, that we're, you know, like a super predator, uh, as a lion would be. So they're always very nervous of humans on two legs. All right, so speaking of super predators um, and those lions who love to sleep. Yeah, now I can see they are now starting to yawn a bit. Three of them I saw they're yawning. I don't know if that is a sign. You can see one is up now there. I don't know if this is a sign that they are going to move from here to somewhere else. One is already up now, I can see standing there. I'm not too sure what is attracting that lion. Oh, now there's a bit of movement. Yeah, just about two of them are moving around there. Yeah, at, at this stage, it's very much difficult here to tell which one has got the highest rank here in this uh, uh, family. Yeah, but uh, when going around with the same pride every time, it's easy to see which one has got much powers. You can see there now, the other one is licking the uh, the other one's back. That helps a lot in order to uh, to create the relationship between the pride. It helps to maintain the relationship. You can see another one is up now. Maybe they are seeing something that we don't see. Maybe they are seeing something that we don't see. I'm just trying to check what is uh, fascinating these lions here. So I'm gonna have to be, I'm gonna have to be very much observant and try to see and I will lower my voice a little bit. Maybe they are seeing something which is nearer 
that I cannot see. One of them is still lying down, not, not much interested on what is going on. Now I've got a better sighting, they are now coming out. Uh, Rosenda, I have been interacting with lions for many years. I used to work for the Marakele National Park, which is in Limpopo, just not very far away from Johannesburg. And I was a lead guide there. I am the one who was walking in front holding a rifle with my back up at the back. So I have encountered lions on a number of occasions. Lions with babies, I've been charged. They, they charged me a lot before. So now I can see things are happening here. Actually, it's more than it's more than five. I can see there is more from the bushes there. Also, now I can see them raising their head. So we are going to have a good sighting here. I can see they are now all starting to come down towards the road. I'm not too sure if they're going to reach the road or decide not to come to the road. But activities has just started now. They are now very active and they are moving towards the eastern side of the of the reserve. I just want to see if they're gonna come to our 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 boundary. So there is uh, the leading a uh, female there heading towards uh, our boundary now. The direction is they are all now entering the Juma Game Reserve. Here comes another one following. Uh, but there's no sign of any. Yeah, the one in front now is walking and stopping. Maybe there's something they're following. I am going to follow them and see. What is it that they are trying to follow there? Look at that. Beautiful, eh? Look at the black tips of the ears. These animals, their roar is associated with the African experience. They look very small, but they can make a very big noise. There's, there's one coming there still. Yeah, uh, the, the chances of hunting activities are very high, considering the weather. And when I'm looking at their bellies, I can see that they, they don't really have much in their bellies. So now I just want to see if we can have a better sighting from here where we are. Yeah, but looking at the at the bellies, uh, if you can check this one now, going to pass, you can see that it, 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 she doesn't have much. So I am not seeing any sign of too much food in that stomach. Remember, the hunting activities on cats is motivated by what is in the stomach. When they've got too much in the stomach, they cannot run very fast. So maybe they, they are looking at something. So when I'm looking at that one on the road, it seems like there is something that they're seeing that I am not seeing because the other ones went much more this side. So it's quite a number of them here. So now I'm just going to uh, pull forward and see what is going to happen. Already I have seen there is even more still at the back. So they are following. I think there's two at the back still uh, coming to follow this one. So 
it's difficult to tell the amount of lions here by this pride at this stage. But as soon as I see them all, now we can go back to Steve and uh, see if Tandy is found on the other side. Not yet, but um, you might have some luck, Sydney, with those lions. Wouldn't that be incredible to see the lions killing a buffalo? Well, they've been following them, so that's what they do. Lions in these areas seem to be quite specialized at, at buffalo, but no, we haven't quite found Tundi yet. I've followed the GPS point that brought us to the area. Ah, okay, there's the tracks now. Did I turn around, Dave? I didn't, eh? Okay, here's some tracks right here which might be the tracks that we are looking for we didn't quite drive this far so we're just gonna have a little look around here vehicles gone off just a little bit over here on the right hand side but apparently it was visible from the road so we're just gonna keep very slowly here there are definitely some fresh vehicle tracks right here which is what we are looking for Apparently she had killed a small animal. I wonder if any of you out there can quickly hashtag Safari Live and let us know what you think Tundi might have gotten this time. Sorry, Darby. That's a little branch. Maybe it's a trick question. Aha, maybe it's not a trick question. Steve Volvo is full of trick questions, tracks, I'm sure we're going to find her very soon. Won't be far off, but it just goes to show how incredible, incredibly camouflaged these cats are. We were just moving up and down with the, the help of our wonderful thermal camera, just scanning around, having a look to see if we could see her. We spotted a a small antelope just up there I'm not going to say its name because it might give away your decisions on what you think she might have have killed okay so this tracks going this way and this way so I'm gonna go straight first have a look around this termite mound what do you think Darby look around this termite mound first and then come back to to those tracks there hmm where are you young lady She's not that young, is she? We know she likes termite mounds. And do we think Columba's going to be with her? Tundi, you've been very quiet since Sunday. We haven't seen Columba since last week sometime. I'm trying to remember when last we saw her. There go the tracks. Gone over this little stump here. We shall do the same. Okay, well, while we try and find Tundi, we're doing whatever she's doing. Let's go to Sydney. The lions are on the move. Welcome to the uh, Unsheltered broadcast. I am Sydney, and now I am following some uh, lions trying to... So you can see now it's, uh, it's stalking the buffalo. Okay, everyone, we're just coming down towards Twin Dams, um, and it sounds like Hosana has crossed into Little Gowry. So I think we might be a little bit unlucky, but uh, I've just spotted an animal up here, here. I always get a little bit nervous because I thought it was buffalo, but uh, it's not buffalo, it's wildebeest. So we don't need to worry too much. There they are. Just ahead of us there, um, and shame, that's, uh, that's Mr. Hosanna just having walked across the boundary, um, Gowry, Maine, as it's called. So he's crossed to the south um, of our traverse. Um, 
And sorry about that. I don't know what the gremlins were doing there. You know, they, they sometimes attack at the worst moment. But, um, well, nonetheless, we're out on foot, and we generally don't get attacked too much by the gremlins out here. So, um, well, we can look at these animals that also do look a bit like gremlins and do the wildebeest, don't they? I would say they do. And a very, very strange-looking face. And um, I think it's with the with the Zulus, and the, I'm not sure about the Shangan as well, they, their sort of um, cultural stories around them is that the, the wildebeest is a mix of all sorts of animals. Um, so they are, are not the normal uh, animals in, in the sort of local traditions. Now, I'm going to go down towards uh, Twin Dams and just make sure that uh, Hosanna maybe doesn't come back uh, there. But while I'm doing that, of course, you'll have to go back to the lions. Yeah, it is uh, a very interesting sighting here where I am. I can see the lions are trying to stalk a group of buffaloes. Already they are arranging the positions as uh, as I'm talking now. It's just that they are getting very much camouflaged with the grass. Something is happening here. We might be lucky with an interesting action. Buffaloes, they are not aware about the presence of the lions here. So I can see that they, they are slowly trying to approach the, the buffaloes. So I am not going to move here where I am. And I'm not going to talk loudly as well, because I don't want to disturb these hunting activities. I can see the buffaloes are coming and they're coming at a very high speed. So two are just waiting there. Yeah, I'm also very much excited here. Good afternoon and welcome to the unscheduled broadcast. I have got some lion activities taking place here with me now. And for your comments and questions, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. Something can happen at any time here as I'm talking. It's quite a number of buffalo versus a quite number of lions. The Talamati Pride. You can see the distance between the lions and these buffaloes is approximately less than 150 to 200 meters. There is even something I heard now. I heard a leopard sowing. So the wind is right on the favor of the lions. These buffaloes are definitely coming closer and closer. But I can see that they have not yet discovered the presence of the king of the jungle. It seems like these lions knew about the presence of the buffaloes in this area. They might have been following these buffaloes since yesterday. It's in a position, in a position. Apparently, one buffalo is going to be enough for this pride.
they are very stationary feeding, comfortable, not aware about what is happening in the surrounding. Uh, Thomas, yes, the lions, they look hungry, but not very hungry. You can see another one is trying to have a position, is talking from the northern side. So these lions at this stage, they have closed, they have closed all the corners. Some are on the southern side of the buffaloes and one is on the northern side whereas one is right on the front. All the buffaloes have stopped. I'm not too sure if maybe the buffaloes have stopped because they have discovered something or it's just about stopping to try and check before they move on. The wind is blowing and still the wind is blowing towards us and where I am is where these lions are waiting. So at this stage the wind is still favoring the lions. Uh, Kenny, my cameraman is okay. It's just that he's trying to cover all the lions for you to see what is happening at the same time. The distance now between the lion that we are seeing together with the animal is now, I can say, it's about 100 meters. So let's just be patient and see what is going to happen. You can see, Rosh, thank you. Uh, it is the most exciting part of hunting activities when it comes to these cats. Look, look at that one. It's approaching very slowly. Look at that. Approaching very slowly. The lions which are already on the southern side are quite very much close to these buffaloes. So that buffalo is very close to the lions. Maybe it's even less than 70 meters the one that is walking in front. And there is quite a few of lions right there. So at this stage, anything can happen. The buffaloes, yes, they can use this chance to chase these lions if they discover, but at this stage, the buffaloes are not aware about what is happening now. They might not see it happening. At 
anything can just happen. This is too close now. So the buffaloes are coming too close and these lions are managing to contain them. The distance now is very close. You can even see now we can go to James who is also seeing the, the lions. Right, we've come out here to help just sort of get the best possible pictures of a potential lion hunt here of buffalo, which is really the ultimate Kruger predator experience. And there's nobody else here except Sydney, and so I thought, well, let me come round and see if we can't sort of double team this hunt. It's a wonderful situation to be in. Now we've got a lioness there, it looks like, well, it might be a young male actually, staring at the buffalo. The buffalo have got no idea. And there's an even younger male going round the side of this termite mound. What they do not realise, of course, I think the lions don't realise this perhaps, is that this is a group of bulls. I don't see any youngsters in that herd there. I think that's a group of straggling bulls, because the rest of the herd that you saw at the beginning of this drive is still sitting at the waterhole, or just beyond it. Yeah, this is all bulls. Alrighty, for those of you who were watching on social media, here we go, we have some tremendous action here. Craigus, let's go to the lioness on the road there. Sydney's going to get... Oh, surely the buffalo must notice... How many lions are there? Sydney had about four or five lions earlier. He's got another view of them from where he's sitting. We're in the perfect position. They are now only about 25 meters apart from each other. 75 feet odd. The buffalo still are not reacting as though they've seen the lions. Some people will tell you that buffalo have poor eyesight. I'm not convinced that that's the case. He's going to step right onto the lioness now. Straight to look at this. Oh, hello. Look at this standoff. Look at this. Another lioness coming from the back. That lioness has got it, had managed to get all the way around them. There are five or six lions here. Let's move through clouds of dust all over unfortunately heading into a part of the reserve we can't go we'll just see if we can get across this fire break area coughing choking on dust I had no idea there were so many lions there absolutely phenomenal stuff now unfortunately we cannot go north or across this road but let's just see if we can't hear perhaps the distress call they went running in there. No, I can't hear anything. That was spectacular. I think there were eight lions there chasing that herd of buffalo, that small herd, like I say, of bulls, and at least four of them had managed to get around the back of the buffalo. And, well, the ambush was set, it was perfectly executed, except that, of course, their courage failed them at the very last moment. Well, why wouldn't it? It's not unusual, of course, for big bull buffalo to toss lions into the air, and I suspect that the chasing ones just weren't fast enough to get onto them. Let's go a little bit f further forward. There's Sydney in front of us. What a sighting. Well, they're behind us. I see, I see that Sydney has possibly got another sighting. I think he's calling this Tingana. I think a leopard has just crossed the road behind us. This is, this is tremendous. There's a lion. We'll wait for Sydney to go and see what he can find that side. 
There's another lioness. I don't think there is going to be any lion kill action here, I'm afraid. Well, good for the buffalo. Not great for us, but of course, these lions will probably not give up. And they'll keep following and harassing these buffalo. All right, those of you who just joined us on social media, an action-packed afternoon continues. Sydney, I think, is after a leopard over there. So if you would like to continue watching the show, just go to YouTube, type in Safari Live. You can watch the rest of the show. Sydney's going towards a leopard. Steve's on his way to a leopard. And, in fact, uh, Ralph on foot is also on his way to a leopard, so there should be leopards galore. Uh, well, we'll see you next time when the action breaks. Alrighty, everybody. Sydney is having an unbelievable afternoon. He's now got the old Duke. A very beautiful. I was busy watching the lions. I just heard this leopard sowing shortly after the lion started chasing. Tingana just came out. So I'm just gonna try and, and go, uh, try and find a space so that we can have a good sighting. It is very much interesting at the moment. The uh, demarcate is territory. What a lovely sighting. What a lovely afternoon. So they, the, the lepers, they prefer to go around and patrol. So now we can go to a uh, Stephen and see what uh, Tandy is doing on the other side. If you go Tandy already. I cannot believe what is going on this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, but we came back to the termite mound that we originally checked and then we followed a track out and that must have been the track that the people came in and we decided to come back and use the thermal camera t to search and thankfully the thermal camera picks up heat as it does and we were able to see Tundi hiding in the long grass and there she is, her head is down, she's having a little bit of a nap. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, the playful Tlalumba is on the scene. She is just hiding at the moment, but I have no doubt she will make herself available in a few moments. I have a feeling that she is busy feeding on the small kill that Tandy provided for. I can't see her at the moment, but she's just behind that blade of grass there. <laughs> even though we can't see her on the... Maybe she's moved, Dave, because... Oh, there we go. There you can see her. Hello, you little one. Welcome to the show. It is a, there's a huge amount of animals going on this moment at the moment. Tlalamba, Tandi, Talamatis, Tingana. There's a lot of teas. Did you notice that? What's going on with all the teas? And we're on tortured. Oh, my word. I think I'm over teed it today, Darby. If only we'd brought some tea, we could have had a cup of tea as well. So, I haven't had any answers yet. I wonder if the viewers just gave a few answers through on what small animal they think Tundi might have killed. Uh, James told me. I haven't seen it yet, so we can't give you the big reveal. But if anyone's got some information or some thoughts about what small animal they believe Tundi might have killed and is now obviously left to the playful Tlalumba, to feed on you're most welcome to send through your one word tweet hashtag safari live or on the youtube stream
You are all thrilled to see them. We are too. We weren't going to give up. We knew they were here somewhere. But you know, when you get a GPS pin off of a phone, there's always a little bit of room for error from distance. So there's no way we could have seen this from the road, which is what we thought we might have been able to. But when you drove off about 50 meters, came around a termite mount, used the thermal camera, and that is how we found her. If you want to have a little look at the thermal camera in a moment, um, Lou, you're most welcome to. Nice warm tundi sitting in the afternoon. Her belly is a little bit bloated. She's eaten a little bit of something. She's not full. Angie and Crafty, you reckon it may be a scrub hair? Well, I don't think it was a scrub hair. Tandy's got a little bit of food in her belly. Normally if she kills a scrub hair, Columba gives her nothing of it. Or if she ate it herself, there'd be nothing left for Columba. And she also went and brought her. So she must have gone and collected the cub at some point and brought her here. I don't really know. I wasn't here this morning. But hopefully we will get another view and we'll be able to find exactly what it is. I was told what it is, but it'd be nice to see it and to show you on camera as well. Rosh, we would think it was a daker. That is Tundi's favorite meal, it was a daker, but apparently it is not a daker. Apparently it was not a daker, but we shall still see. We've got the little Columbus head is up again, Darby. She wants to have a little bit of time on the camera. It's not the best view of her. We'll spot her there in the long grass and then maybe if you want to go to the thermal, Lou, you might get a little bit more of a view. It's a little bit obscured actually by that grass. Just goes to show it's a little bit thick. Her head's up again. You can see her moving. Okay, well we're going to go to the fleur. There we go. You can just see the warm ear and head of the little one. And the way that she's behaving makes it, to me, seem like she's feeding on something. Just in time, because Tundi's gone completely flat. Look at that. Without the thermal, you would not see her there. Going back to the normal camera, look at that. There's no obvious sign of a leopard behind that grass, is there? Okay, well, it seems like it's a jam-packed afternoon with all the characters, and let's go back over to Sydney, who somehow found Tingana. Yeah, it seems like Tingana is after something, because he is walking, stopping, listening, and there's some warning calls as well given by some of the animals by the southern direction which is where he's heading now so i'm just gonna try by all means and follow tingana and see what he is up to so let me just try and follow him and see why what he's up to this afternoon so this is quite very exciting eh? Yeah, that is quite very much interesting. Unbelievable to have such a great sighting at the same time. So I can see here where I'm going that there is, there is quite a very a big dong in front. So I just want to see if maybe that is where he is going. very much relaxed but still trying to listen to what is happening here quite a beautiful animal They're very much beautiful so now i will see what he's thinking every time he's moving the ears i heard a little bit of noise earlier from the direction where he's trying to concentrate. Your 
can see Tingana is slowly going that side, but it's not just going, it's going, standing and shaking and listening and sniffing. Not too sure what he's up to. And that is what I want to establish. He's trying to sniff just to get hold of the information. Maybe there are some other animal activities here that is trying to pick up. So there's quite a very big donger right ahead of Tingana. Yeah, there was some elephant trumpeting now. He heard that this, those were the elephants, some elephants in the area. He confirmed that it's not a small animal. Maybe it's the elephants breaking branches. So now uh, we can uh, go to uh, Ralph. Well, just in time. I'm sorry about the audio with Ralph, whatever's going on that side. But don't worry, folks. Columba is stalking up to her mother. Don't know which camera to look at, to be honest with you, Lou. It's really your choice at the moment. But I've got a feeling she's going to come up behind Tandy and jump on her. The spots disappear into the long grass. She's thinking about it. just behind a little bit of grass there, a little branch in the way. Okay, well, we're going to go to the thermal. There you can see her coming through the long grass. Let's see what she's going to do. She's being very delicate in her approach. I have no doubt Mum will not have a clue that she's coming. Because she's a very, very careful young lady, isn't she? She knows exactly where mum is. She's going to come and stalk up on her and catch her from behind, unaware. <laughs> Very important lessons that she's going to learn. Even though there is a, there's some meat nearby, she still needs to know how to, to stalk mum whenever she has the opportunity. We're back on the normal camera. Is she going to go, Darby? I wonder. You can see Tundee flat in the foreground. Not making the most interesting of targets to Columba. But she's going to stalk a bit more. Here she comes. Underneath that little bit of grass. Very delicate. We saw Asana doing this yesterday. You can tell by the intention on the face, folks. The body language. You know, she knows mum is there. This is the behavior that they do when they're stalking something. There's almost this anticipation on the face. The ears cocked forward, very delicate movement of the feet. The tail very flat behind her, her body low to the ground. She's coming, she's within striking range. You can see her, her back legs are almost bunching up behind her. Probably one or two more paces and she's going to launch her attack. Are you ready for this, folks? It's going to come very soon. She's got to put down that one last foot. I'm keeping my eye on Mum. She's pretending she has no idea what's going on. Her eyes are just a little bit open. How well have you done, Columba? Mum might give you a score afterwards. Jennifer, she is an only child. She's got no one else to play with, so she constantly stalking her mum, constantly playing. And mum leaves her for some time. It, 
Every now and again when she leaves her, she makes the most of it. Oh, Tandy's finally spotted her. She finally heard her approaching. And you saw how she quickly got up, which goes to show that Tandy actually had no idea she was coming. She suddenly would have heard a noise quite close to her and she would have had to react. Here we go, good morning. A beautiful Tandy. He looks a bit sleepy still. Did you just wake your mum, Tlalamba? John, very, you want to know a very good question. A question a lot of people ask. Okay, well now it's her turn to go over to the kill and feed. Why will she not attack us? Well, people in, in these areas have, have spent a lot of time with the leopards, a lot of time habituating them. Now habituation means that from a young age, uh, we spend time with the animals and we don't cause them any negative behavior and um, they don't really know what the vehicle is they've never evolved on the African continent with a vehicle is the kill right there is she going to show it to us I think it might be yes it is and so she doesn't see us as a threat we've given her lots of space but she was born to a mother who was relaxed so in the beginning it took a lot of work by individuals to get leopards relaxed and once they get relaxed to the vehicle they're actually quite easy to view with a vehicle from these sort of distances they don't see us as food we never steal their food from them we never um, uh, harass them in any way so they have no real need to um, to need to attack us but on foot they see us as a very different individual because they've evolved on the African continent with the upright standing man and they do not like us very much on foot and either will hide or run away and if you do get too close especially if they've got a cub you can potentially be attacked by a leopard they are potentially dangerous animals so you have to be very careful out on foot you have to know what you're doing and also have to respect the animals they're not attacking us out of any need to feed on us they're attacking us because we are competition And Tandi is a very particular female. She quite often, she quite often likes to show a bit of a funny face towards the camera. Yes, Karen, this mother-daughter duo is fantastic. Hopefully she's going to pull out her food there though, so everybody can finally get the big reveal of what the animal she has caught is. You might hear the approach of another vehicle. We are being joined in the sighting. Lots of people wanting to come and see this beautiful, beautiful leopardess. And I love how she allows Tlalamba to feed and then she goes away and then she comes back. That's the, the characteristic of a, of a solitary cat. They don't like to share their food. You quite often see leopards when they're feeding snarling at each other. They don't want to share. But they know they have to share with their daughter or their son. So it's better for them to just go and sit somewhere else while the youngster does the feeding. Okay, well, it seems like the afternoon is not going to let up at all, and Ralph is on foot with some giant animals. Well, everyone, we're getting close to some elephants here. We spotted them, but we're just coming through the drainage line and just out over onto the other side. There's a whole breeding herd, and we're just trying to get a better view on them because we just saw them through the brush. So now we're just coming onto the other side of the drainage line. They're off to our east, so that, um, well, with the drainage line in between us and them, they'll be nice and calm, um, and they won't feel threatened by us at all, and so we could hopefully get a nice view on them. Now, they're not far from us. They're probably about 100 meters at the most. Um, so we just, as I say, just trying to find a good view through the thickets here from the opposite bank. Um, but it uh, seems like it's a whole breeding herd. There's um, some little babies with them. So 
Hopefully we get to see them nice and clear here. And sorry for that little problem we had with the sound a minute ago. I was actually busy showing you um, some very fresh elephant dung. And there we can see one over there. Yeah, I think we can just see his bottom. He's turning a little bit. You can see the ears flapping there. That's not the only one. There are a few of them around. And that one there. Wow, there's lots of trumpeting. There's a whole herd there. I wonder what that was all about. Some very deep rumbling as well. There's branches breaking all over the place. And that one obviously not moving very much. But uh, there's a whole herd of them. So we will hopefully see them a bit better. That one seems to just be standing still. Just turned its head a bit, flapping its ears. There's lots of them around. Wow, so it seems like it's been quite an exciting afternoon. So Cenac, you say it's great to see Ellie's. Well, there comes another one. Absolutely Cenac, and it's uh, it's even better seeing them on foot. Um, I know we don't get as close to them as we would with the vehicle, but, uh, well, being out on foot uh, really makes you feel part and parcel to the natural environment here, and uh, I just enjoy that. With all the sightings, lion, leopard, elephant, all of it for me is much better on foot. You're really in it. As you feel a little bit detached with a vehicle. Yeah, Louise says in FC, it just reminds you that you're human. And uh, well, when you're on foot, you do need to think uh, about your and the animal's safety a little bit more. Um, and you also need to use your senses. Here comes a little youngster that's running past. There's a bit of smoke in the air as well. I think there's been some more fire break or, or controlled burning going on as well. It's a little bit uh, hazy in the sky here, and I can smell the smoke. So it's making for quite a, an interesting color to the sky as, at the moment as well. And I wonder if it does make the elephants a little bit nervous when they start to get a, a, a bit of the smell of smoke, because obviously it can be quite dangerous for them um, if they get caught in that. So I'm just trying to get ahead a little bit here and just see if we can spot some of them in here and speaking of spot well let's head you on over to some spotted ones well thank you very much Ralph be safe out there please the elephants seem to be all over the place it was so funny this morning when you left us uh, we stayed with Hosanna for a little while longer and a herd of elephants joined the sighting and they didn't quite like the smell of him in the air, and he didn't quite like seeing them there, so he stalked away around us. The elephants behave quite strangely with the smell of leopard in the air, as they often do. So those of you out there, if you can recognize that leg that Tundi's throwing around, that will give you the big reveal. It is a beige-ish sort of leg. You see it just sort of vertical in front of her face. Lou, you have got it 100% on the nose. I wonder if you ladies and gentlemen out there can identify this small animal just by its leg. Bearing in mind that is a fully grown female leopard there. The animal is dead. We've, we've known about this for many hours, so it is definitely dead. She's feeding on the inside, on the hind quarters. And see that's one of the back legs I, I think that actually might be a, a front leg actually looking at it now very hard actually to see oh puma well done well done puma you know your legs marvelous indeed it is puma got it right anyone else throw one more stab out there as we watch her feeding she is the superstar. I was talking about her this morning, how Hosanna has stolen the limelight from her this week. Well, she will not be undone. She will have a cameo appearance in the afternoon with Lalamba and a kill.
And it is indeed, ladies and gentlemen, if you got it right, it is a Steenbock. Now, I have no idea if it's a male or female. One done. Willow and everyone else who got that right. That's why when I said earlier it's a little bit of a trick question because we all assume very quickly that Tundi would have killed a Dacre when I mention the word small animal. We don't see her with many Steenbock. There's lots of Dacre on the property and sort of the favorite leopard habitat for hunting is in the thickets. We tend to find lots more Dacre in those areas even though we did on our way in here we found two Dacre moving around. Steenbok like a little bit more open, a little bit less vegetated in the form of trees where they can see more. So this doesn't, this area we're in kind of seems like the, the mix between the Dacre and Steenbok habitat. But it really is quite cool though if we go to the thermal camera. There's a really nice visual of Tundi feeding there. You can tell if we do have a look at it how cool the meat has become. There we go. She just dropped a piece out of her mouth and you can see it's all very warm. Very, very cool to see these images. You can see the tree behind her that's uh, a little bit warm from the radiated sunlight from this afternoon that is facing west. And there is the warmth of the leopard with her lukewarm animal lying on the ground. It's very, very cool to see. And you can tell she's getting full because she's not lying on her tummy. It's quite uncomfortable to have a foolish belly while feeding. Bobby, you want to know why heat trees give off a heat signature? Well, the, the sun is setting behind us. And so that is the warmth of the sun on the bark. Ooh, that looks like a stomach. Did you see that? That was a big chunk of something. <laughs> Let's go back to the Nomura and we'll zoom in and see what it is she's pulled out there. It was quite a large thing. So essentially it's just the heat of the sun. So when we sit in the sunshine in the morning and we warm ourselves up, that's exactly what the trees are giving off. It's the, the absorptive heat that they have of the, the setting sun and it hasn't been a warm day so the trees aren't very warm but I bet if we looked on the other side of that tree uh, you'd see it probably wouldn't be as as sort of pink it's just all about the heat the angle of the sun the direction it faces uh, west facing slopes in in the southern hemisphere are always warmer or sort of should I say north North facing slopes and northwest is always a little bit warmer than south because it gets far less sun. And Peter Viper, that's a very good question. You want to know about Tundi hoisting? Well, I think, you know, it's still early in the day. Um, I think she she made the kill quite early, so they're going to feed a bit, and there's no real concern for them of, of hyena coming in uh, anytime soon, but uh, she's probably going to move it in the next little while. Maybe even be, it might even be now, and she's going to take it up, up a tree. I think that's the stomach that she just pulled out now, so the scent that starts being given off once the stomach gets broken is quite something, even to the human nose. So no doubt in the next little while as it starts getting later she'll definitely hoist that kill um, we've seen Tlalumba up trees feeding now so I don't think she's not doing it deliberately for her youngster but where she is directly where she is there's not a tall tree the tallest tree is probably about 50 to 60 yards to my right hand side you see it's very small small shrub over here um, the one in the, in the foreground you can see now is not a suitable tree for a leopard to be climbing. But 50 to 60 yards she could be able to drag. And so I'm sure she will in the next little while. They've both had a nice feed on the floor. She's busy plucking the fur. 
and she will definitely move the keel somewhere. Now it'll be a little bit lighter, save her a little bit of a little bit of energy. There we go. You can see the head now. It is a female. It was a female. Shame. See how deliberately she plucks the fur using her incisors. Busy plucking. It's a very characteristic feature done by leopards and cheetah. Before they start feeding on the meat, they pluck the fur out because the fur is really not digestible, and uh, by leopards anyway or lions. And so invariably, what it's going to lead to is her having to throw it up at some point. So she'd rather pluck as much of it out as she can to get to the juicy meat underneath. She's looking like she wants to eat some neck now. Now she's using her incisors to do a little bit of cutting. Okay, well we're going to stay with Tundi and I have no doubt she's going to drag it soon somewhere to be hoisted. But in the meantime, let's go back over to Ralph and some elephant. Well, everyone, we've just come out onto the opposite bank and uh, just keeping a bit of a distance with us and these elephants because not quite sure. There's lots of trumpeting and all sorts going on. It might just be uh, some of the youngsters, you know, playing around, but you never know uh, what the mood of the herd is. So when there's trumpeting and sounds of a bit of stress, well, you just want to be a little bit clear of them. So we don't have the best view on them. Uh, but there are quite a few of them moving through the bushes there. I think you might be able to see a few of their backs and the tops of their ears. And they are moving and feeding and trumpeting and rumbling and all sorts going on. So I've just got myself up on a termite mound and I'm just watching them from here. It is uh, always wonderful to be in the presence of big animals like this. Um, and even with the distance that we have, uh, you know, you still feel like you are really in this wild spot. And uh, you can hear the branches breaking and all sorts going on. Uh, I'm pushing trees over. I can hear some crackling going on there now. Now, Minamu, uh, elephants can misbehave towards humans for a number of different reasons. Um, because they're such intelligent animals, sometimes it can just be because they're in a bad mood on the day. Um, it can be because uh, you get uh, too close um, when they've got babies or they've had an accident or that, you know, there's the mood of the group can be because of one of those reasons. I see there's a couple of little calves with the mother now. Um, it can be because somebody before you has been uh, uh, rude to the elephants, and I mean that from a human perspective. So you never know what the... Oh, there's another trumpet. I don't know if you heard that. Um, so I don't know what... Uh, you know, you never know what the elephants have experienced uh, with humans before you arrive. Um, so that's why sometimes a breeding herd you need to be careful of. Uh, especially when there's little babies around, um, and especially if, if they've had altercations with humans before. When there's bull elephants, you only really need to worry about them when they're in full must, which means that they've got a very heightened testosterone level, and they're just looking for a fight. They're like a young uh, man that's taken too much, um, uh, uh, or he's uh, put steroids into his body so that he can do lots of gymming and look be, be all nice and strong, but it also affects um, his mentality, which makes him want to fight with everybody. So those kind of people... Uh, as with elephants, you want to avoid them, um, and that's exactly what we do here. As long as we don't put ourselves in, a, in, in the wrong situation, we're absolutely fine. And where I'm sitting here, the wind is blowing in my direction, and us, we are 100% safe, and ultimately, so are the elephants. And that's obviously uh, what we try and achieve um, when we're out here in the bush. It's, um, it's not only looking after ourselves, it's also looking after these very precious animals. Here 
very well said Ralph very well said we have moved a little bit further forward to get a better view of the mischievous and playful little Talamba who is not looking so little anymore ah oh, what a marvelous little yawn that was excuse me there you can see her enormous ears they are really big ears She's going to grow into them, I wonder. Tumba hasn't yet grown into his ears. But isn't she beautiful? <clears throat> I don't really know more about the Tumba and Anderson interaction that, that you viewers maybe saw the day before. Um, all I know is I, I saw that picture Tristan showed me of Anderson male missing an eye and Tumba in the tree above him So how that played out is very hard to know. I'm pretty sure Okay, well it seems like Tumba managed to escape I don't know where he is now. Maybe he's going to come back for a reunion like his cousin Osana Come back in and play around Juma for a little while. That would be wonderful. Here we go, little Columba. You're learning how to clean yourself beautifully. And get the steering book off of my face. Mm, lots of yawns happening. And it's time to move soon, I think, little one. Going to go and play with mum. Minamu, with regards to African Indian leopards, I believe that the much of a muchness. I had the impression initially that they were bigger, the Indian leopards, but I have been, I have researched it a bit more, and they are not. I think they're very, very similar in size. The Indian leopard being a subspecies of the African leopard, Pantheropardus, but I think there is not too much in the way of of size difference. Obviously, there's probably some genetic differences amongst them. For example, in South Africa, you get Pantheropardus up here in the low felt, which is these leopards that we see. But then you also get the Cape leopard, which is actually the same species, but yet they are far smaller. And that's got a lot to do with the food that they eat. Being a smaller leopard down there has benefited them. So nature has kind of selected for the smaller gene down there, whereas up here, you need to be a little bit bigger to, to sort of fit into the food chain up here and being too small uh, would have competed more with the caracal and the serval I would say so they kind of fit in that niche just above but yet the same species there we go did you get something caught in the claws oh sorry about the grass there folks Davi if you want me to move back a meter I will if she puts her head down again I think it's time for a nap little Thalumba have you been playing for hours Hey, when last did you or the viewers at home see Columba so relaxed? She's normally so all over the place, isn't she? Doesn't leave mum alone. That's probably been her day, running around, jumping all over mum. She's now got a belly full of steenbok. Carrie, I think that's a very good question. I think the antelope have got a different smell. Um, so I think she definitely knows the difference between them from a smell point of view. I think their shape and their outline are very similar. I mean, she sees them as a prey item, the way they move and the size. Uh, but she could probably differentiate the two because uh, they are slightly different sizes and shapes. But I don't think it matters to her really. She sees one of them and it'll just click on that, that hunt mode. Um, it's all about search image in the African wilderness. They're not really seeing depth, they're not seeing three dimensions, they're seeing an image. And that is why the strategies of Dake and Steenbock work so well for them in their defense, is if they stand very still, they're not seen, but it's when they're moving around that their position is given away. And that's when the leopards go into stalk and hunt mode. And uh, any small antelope, any small moving animal, really, of a particular size, would encourage a leopard or would gr grab a leopard's interest. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but I, she seems to have a lot of dacre, but that has probably just got a lot to do with the area that she frequents. And um, having a little Tlalumba near her, 
it is quite safe to be within drainage lines and sort of river areas where there's some tall trees to climb up and lots of bush to sort of shelter in. And now that Columba is getting a little bit bigger, she's able to range a little bit further out into sort of a little bit more open bush without as many tall trees sort of on the slopes of the of the ridges rather than down in just the valleys where we seem to have spent a lot of time with her. And those are the two sort of primary areas, the dacre like, the very thick vegetation at the bottom, although they do move out a little bit, but the steenbok like are much more open terrain with clumps of bushes rather than thickets. That is the primary sort of habitat change, although there is an, seems to be an enormous overlap here in the Sabi Sands, but far more dacre than there are steenbok, although you do see lots of sign of steenbok wearing on foot or their little the little latrines that they cover so I don't know if we had to put one of each down in front of her who would she choose well by the statistics we've seen well I've seen personally Dacre would be the number one on the menu for her but I don't think she would really have too much of a of a say she would go for both she would like both up a tree at the same time and in that way she'd be able to suit suitably feed the duke on his wanderings because it seems like Sydney might have lost him yeah I am still on the look uh, for Tingana uh, he just got disappeared somewhere in these bushes and he went down to the other side of the drain so now I am uh, going back to the main road and drive around and see if maybe I can come across him. He's going towards the eastern direction of the game reserve. Yeah, the chances of seeing him again, they are very high. Unless he got interested on something on his way down and decide and, uh, and do some hunting. Because he was very much inquisitive earlier. He was investigating something. Not too sure if Tingana as well is looking for a meal. So I can see here where I've been driving, there was quite a lot of uh, folk tail drongos. They were trying to use me to catch insects as I'm driving. Robin, Tingana, when I saw him today, he's in a very good condition. There was no sign of any injury. He was not limping at all. So I'm just going to join the, the Mbubu Road. He's going to come out somewhere between Mbubu Road and this road I'm driving on now. Mbubu Road is one of the roads in the middle of the game reserve. So he's right in this block at the moment. So now um, we can now go to Steve with uh, Tandy and Talamba on the other side. Well, there they are. There is the daughter of the Duke. She's stopped grooming herself now. Tandy is not very, very well in the open at the moment. She's still feeding hasn't decided to do anything about that steenbok kill just yet. It wasn't even too clear how much was left, but we do know that she does have a, an enjoyment for the face. We've seen her eat the cheeks before. There we go. You, can, you can't really see her there. This is what Dave and I were doing earlier. I'm trying to find her, scanning with the camera, scanning with the thermal, you can just see her there, just behind the bushes. There she enjoys her meal.
before going into the cold evening. Just see the, the change in the colors as the sun slowly starts setting. In the west, we will be leaving shortly. We don't want to spend any time with these two cats with meat on the ground after dark. Hello, John. It's a debatable uh, what parts are eaten first, but quite often you will see leopards and cheetah. Oh, hang on. Up you get. Look at the warm spot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking, I'm looking at two <laughs> two screens. Yeah, She left a very nice warm spot there when she got up. John, you often see leopard and cheetah feeding on either the rump first or opening sort of the stomach and eating the internal organs. Not necessarily the stomach, but the internal organs first. Now, it really is a an animal specific sort of thing uh, or an individual specific thing and um, you often I often see them eating the rump first but then I have seen also animals starting inside the belly I don't know what drives them either day what is on the menu okay no problem Lou and they eat the choice bits first so the rump and internal organs are the, the best parts of the animal and then after that they take their time but leopards have time that's why they pluck the fur out and um, take their time and they feed on the best bits that they want and the tundies has to leave little bits of it for for little columba obviously and so what we saw the last time I saw her up the tree with a dacre kill Columba was eating the ears which was quite funny Okay, so Tandy's looking around. She knows it's getting dark. She knows it's time to do something about this meat because it will attract the, the scavengers of the night. You can see her thinking, where am I going to go with this? Where's the closest tree? Hmm, a good question, Lauren very good question I haven't spent much time with with young leopards on their own in my experience um, so I don't know that must be probably about between thir one, yeah, 13 and 15 months somewhere around there but I've no doubt that they kill earlier than that I just haven't seen it they will kill lizards and small birds and whatever little things that jump around on them but um, I haven't spent too much time with youngsters since being here in Juma I haven't seen Tlalamba make a kill yet. I've no doubt while mum's away she does all sorts of naughty stuff. It's all part and parcel of learning and practicing for the real world. But yeah, you know, from about a year they're able to catch all sorts of things, nothing really big. But before that it's all trial and error. And even when they catch it, they don't really know what to do with it. That killer killer instinct is something they have to practice instinctively know how to catch things but how to kill it Karen a very important aspect about this is we've got a leopard and her young cub Her young cub is about nine months old they have got a kill there's meat the meat is going to give off some form of smell and that is going to attract hyena uh, invariably hyena and so you don't really want to be here in presence uh, giving off noises making any sort of sounds you know, if, if the, the kill was in a tree, um, we could maybe think about it, but the kill is not in a tree, so she could potentially be surprised, and we don't want to be a reason the hyena maybe move in. Um, they are very quick to climb a tree, leopards, but the kill will invariably bring it forward. But a leopard that we will be looking at after dark, Sydney has managed to relocate to the Duke. I managed to uh, reallocate Tingana. He is just water hole now. I can see he's now moving towards that. Uh, look at Tingana, uh, demarcating his territory. Beautiful. This is how the cats leave behind the information about their presence in the area.
You see, he's now giving some of the facial glands. Beautiful. It was never easy to get hold of Tingana again. It's just that I was not aware he was heading to the water hole. So I'm still going to uh, follow Tingana and see his intentions when he comes to the other side. Because he's going to come out by the open area where there's a lot of activities taking place by this time. So I'm just now going to uh, try by all means and uh, follow Tingana. Just want to see what Tingana is thinking. Maybe he's thinking about having a, a meal at this stage. Yeah, I can see he's not that very much relaxed. He's checking everything. So I'm just gonna... Uh, Paul Cat, Mama, I didn't get your question very nicely. FC, if you can just uh, re refresh that question again. Yeah, uh, Paul Cat, Mama, the life of a solitary animal is very much difficult. And it's not easy for them to take down the prey because when they are working as a team it becomes much easier but for a male alone it's very much difficult the disadvantage is is not difficult it, it, it is very difficult to hunt alone <clears throat> so maybe somewhere in this area is where it's gonna come out yeah I am now just going down the drainage line and here is where I am hoping to meet him. Let me just try and come out somewhere here. Let me just try and check here. No, he was walking very much slow, so he might come out somewhere here. Yeah, I can see that uh, there is some movement between these bushes here let me just try and check if this movement are the movement for uh, a tingano i saw some oh yes there is tingana now he's coming out i can see him there so i'm just gonna try and reverse and see what he's trying to look at Maybe he's also up to something. It's quite a well. So now we can go to Ralph on his way to home and see what he's got. Well, everyone, as dusk settles towards another night, um, I was reminiscing a little bit today um, uh, about uh, our beautiful country, South Africa, because yesterday uh, was the 100th birthday celebration for Nelson Rolithlatha Mandela, a.k.a. Man uh, Madiba. Um, and so I was watching a few things about uh, our transition uh, to democracy uh, this afternoon and just reminding uh, myself about uh, all the things that happened while I was growing up um, and also just reminiscing about the whole sort of process of democracy and how things changed uh, in our beautiful country and, uh, uh, and also looking at the R Rivonia trial um, and all of those kind of political things that happened in our country that uh, really uh, forged um, the future it was at the time and uh, oh, I'm just getting 
I indicated that there might be some elephants here. Now, it's obviously also beautiful for us uh, with that whole democratic change that we are able to um, peacefully walk in, in this beautiful area. We're just going to have a look up here ahead um, and see if these elephants, in fact, are nearby. They have been trumpeting and going crazy. Um, so let's just have a look. And just make sure that's Aubrey, the game scout, is just clearing the road as well. Once again, the elephants do have a sense of humor, I believe. So just clear that up. Just make sure that these elephants aren't anywhere nearby. Aubrey, you think they're close, huh? Ah, oh, okay, they moved off. So there was one just close to us, and I was just talking a bit loud. I thought they were a little bit further because we heard them trumpeting a little bit of a way off. But um, anyway, as I was saying, um, yes, the Ravonia trial and, and how things moved on from there. Um, and in 1994, when uh, Nelson was uh, let out of jail, and we, well, he was, uh, you know, uh, we went to a democratic uh, election. And 1995, we won the Rugby World Cup. Uh, rugby and uh, well it's just now made it for me the one of the most beautiful countries in the world and I live here and my kids get to grow up here and look at this we've got some elephants just in front of us here let's see if we can get a view on them come on they're just on the road in front of us Just headed off a little bit. You can probably smell us as well. The wind is blowing with us. So there he is. He's a little bit nervous, but he's headed off. He's, you see that? It's incredible sometimes how such big animals, um, not only giraffe can be quite scared of us, even the elephants. There's one a bit further up along the road there. He's making himself now a little bit more visible. There was a youngster that was just here, close to us. But... Uh, what an amazing place to live, huh? South Africa. Where else can you go out on foot and witness elephants? Africa, I love you so much. Nkosi Sikaleli, i Africa. Well, you are back with us, ladies and gentlemen. And Tandi has still not taken her kill up the tree. The lumber has moved into a, a behind a little branch. And she's having a look in the distance. A herd of zebra started moving in this direction. I don't think she's any threat to them or they to her. But I feel like it is time that she's going to pick up her kill and go move it. You can see the change in the eyes, I feel as the night starts to pick up or to descend you see a change in leopard's eyes as the pupils start to get bigger and they start to get a little bit wilder those of you who've got domestic cats will probably have experienced that when your cat comes inside after being outside for some time they come in and they look a little bit mad not mad but wild i always used to love that with my cat it took a little while to calm down she's been running around yeah, that feral glow in the eyes indeed and they're also very alert like that relaxed house cat sort of feel wonder if any of you can relate and well she's paying very careful attention she's listening trying to smell is there any threat to her kill look I'm talking about. She's having a look at the zebra that we can't see. We can just hear them. Take care. That's a great question. Well, I don't really know, but I think the liver has got an enormous amount of minerals and lots of iron in it. But I don't really know too much about the, the sort of nutrient components of, of internal organs. I just know that it's highly valued around the world and turn organs from a from a, a nutrient point of view which ones are better I don't know I think I'd go with the liver because it does a lot of filtering or a lot of a lot of secretions come out of there kidneys I wouldn't think so much 
lots of uric acid and things like that but still people enjoy them here we go a little bit of play hello mum I'm almost as long as you it's Talamba's turn they've just done a tag team session she's gone and said okay child your turn to feed And Tandy's going to move off a safe distance because she knows she can't watch her daughter feed. She can't manage it. <laughs> she wants to get involved behind the only shrub in the way. Lalumba's turn on the Steenbok. Very cool. Look how, war Look how cute she is. She's beautiful. She's like, Mum, you didn't leave me much. See that surprised look she's getting? <laughs> Is this all? <laughs> now she's looking for anything that might have fallen out. Maybe she's got a particular favourite part she thought would be there when she came back. That's where it was originally. I can I can sympathise with her having an older brother. I always used to keep my favourite part of our food somewhere, and he'd always he was always always find it. Why am I surprised that whenever I came back it was gone? <laughs> and Dave is having a chuckle. Can you sympathise, Darby? Darby can sympathise there. How many of you back home have got an older sibling who used to take the best piece? I always used to keep a, my favourite piece of food on the plate as well. Just on the side, you know, that's the last mouthful. And he would just squirrel that down. I love my brother. I give him a hard time. <laughs> Lou, Louise says she doesn't have siblings but she lives with us Lou, no one's stolen any food from you but trying to hide it away or leaving something for later in the kitchen don't don't try to do that there's way too many mouths there's way too many midnight snackers amongst us if you hide anything away you better hide it well so there we go Tlalumba yeah, apparently Darby is one of the main offenders for midnight snacking. But see, Tlalumba's learning. She knows instinctively that there's a kill there. And this is the time of day that it's going to start potentially getting dangerous. It's still, it's still light. She can still see. Well, they can still see in the dark. But it's kind of getting to that time when Ahina are going to start moving around, start prowling around. Tundi seems quite relaxed to it. But this happens to them every single day, folks. Every single day they are out and they have the potential for Hyena to rock up on the scene. We do have the benefit of having the infrared camera. So when the lights do go down, we can watch without influencing from a light point of view. So to add on to my point of view earlier, historically we used to use lights to view animals and we as Wild Earth Safari Lab don't do that, but lots of other vehicles still do that. They don't have the technology we have, and so it's the lights and the disturbance that comes with the lights that is something we need to be very cognizant of. But we're a safe distance off. We could potentially stay here for many, many hours, but we're just going to keep it to the way we've been doing the debate and give them space as it starts getting dark. Well, it seems like Sydney has managed to keep up with the Duke, and I feel like he's gone to have himself a drink. Yeah. Good, thanks, eh? Good. Okay, so it looks like we're still back. Sorry about losing Sydney there. Lalamba still feeding on um, the little Steenbok. Not sure what technical issue went or went on there, but we're still with this leopardess and her cub. But we will be leaving shortly. <laughs> we're having a few technical issues today, unfortunately, but thankfully we're in Torchwood and we're able to, to get all of these beautiful shots for you. Last couple of times I've been through here wasn't so successful, but today seems to be working very well. Thanks, Conrad, for your hard work in the tech team there. So 
that Lalumba is using her carnassial shear, the side of her mouth, the very sharp teeth that define a carnivore, to cut through the bone or the sinew and the flesh Okay, well it seems like Sydney has managed to iron out his gremlin, so let's go back over to the Duke. I uh, still have got Tingana. I did manage to reallocate Tingana. He is now heading towards the open space. That is concentrating the some um, animals, giving some alarm calls about his presence. Monkeys are alerting the impalas and the impalas are joining. It's just noisy everywhere. You can see he stops there now to try and check the impalas. They're just making noise everywhere. My apologies for the pole. For the pole. It seems like he picked up an audio of something. Okay, I'm sorry about that folks, there seem to be technical errors happening, but don't worry, we, we're about to leave, we're about to start the engine as we, how we started, but everything is still fine, it's still light enough, we've given her lots of space, there's no lights on, so from a sensitivity point of view we're doing everything right. little youngsters filling her belly. I wonder how much of that Steinbock is actually left. Didn't see too much, did you, Davi? First time I saw Tandi and Tlalamba with a, a Steinbock was back in February. I think it was February. Maybe it was March. But she was a lot smaller then. It took them a few days to finish. I think she's increased her appetite quite some, some bit. And uh, she's going to be matching her mum for meals very soon. That's one of the biggest reasons why leopards have been to end up kicking their cubs out. They start eating too much, the demand for food gets too high, and if they're a, a male, they just start getting a little bit too feisty around the feeding site. You can see how Tundi's already segregating herself from Tlalumba while they feed. I said earlier they don't like to share. It's part of the competitive edge that keeps leopard, leopards on their toes. Uh, Tingana is still walking towards the eastern direction of uh, of the of the park, and I'm just trying to uh, find a better visual. There are some impalas here. Also, they are concerned about the presence of Tingana at this stage. Maybe he's gonna uh, have interest on those impalas. So maybe he's going to have interest on those impalas. He's just looking at them now. So the impalas, they have been making quite a lot of alarm calls, but now they, they are settled. You can see the tail is moving a little bit. So that tail has got quite a lot to tell. Look at that. The impalas are still giving some alarm calls.
So the the lepers, they just show that this is the uh, uh, the, 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 lep, the leopard, but they they cannot be able to see that spot very well because that is quite a very nice design, uh, which is good for him to hide and to hunt. So to see him clearly, they cannot see him clearly. They know there is a predator here because they have been alert by listen to that beautiful isn't it <laughs> that is when he's sowing so you can see that he doesn't have much interest on this impalas as now he's even starting to make some noise loud noise so now the impalas are sure he just confirmed his presence now So let me just try and see uh, if I, I'm going to have a, a better sighting again from the other angle. Mm. Maybe we're going to have a good sighting from this angle now I didn't copy that question uh, FC There is quite a, a, a big difference between sowing and other calls. So when he's sowing, you will hear he's going to do it about three to four times. You will hear him, it's like someone is cutting a tree. <laughs> and apart from that, the chaff, which is also a different kind of a sound. Not too sure what Tingana is up to this afternoon. Maybe he's just patrolling his territory. It's a normal behavior because these animals, they're, they're gonna have, they must have to go back to their territorial marking points in order to renew the scent. He just got disappeared there so i just i'm just gonna move now and see if we're gonna have a better sighting again yeah tingana has just got disappeared in one of the dongas here maybe he's gonna come out it's not quite a very a big donga, it's a very small donga. There's no other animals around here. It's only him. So a donga is like a an area that has been eroded by quite a lot of uh, water before. It's like a dry riverbed. Uh, some of the birds have just started giving some calls now. Maybe he is walking towards the uh, the bushes. Oh yeah! Now I pick. I managed to pick up. Uh, Thanks for the uh, command, proud cat mama. Yeah, the leopards, they are so very much beautiful, especially the young ones. Yeah, I can see now uh, the, 
uh, Tingana is uh, right here, but he's just walking and stopping and sewing. So it's difficult to tell his intentions at this stage. It's very stationary, nice and camouflage. Now you can see the, the, the difference his color is making. You can easily match the surrounding. Those spots, they can easily match the background. You can see when he's walking as well, it's, it's not easy to notice him by these dry grasses. Especially now during the dry season when the vegetation, the leaves is, is more brown and dry and red and silver, it camouflage the animals. So my apologies for the poles. When I left this afternoon, I thought the rain was gonna come any time shortly after I have started, but now I can see rain is not coming, so the poles for my roofs are disturbing a little bit. My apologies for that. Beautiful. Let me just try and see if uh, we can go to the eastern side and see if we can have a better, better sighting. He's not even preferring to walk on the road. You can see he is interested to walk on the pathways. So a, a comment from James about the recovery of Tingana. A comment from James about the, the recovery of Tingana. Thank you very much for that comment. Yes, he is now recovering. So it's quite a very lovely sighting. Eh? Tingana has now recovered. Yeah, I can see the injury is not completely recovered, but you can see that it's getting there. So now Tingana is trying to uh, avoid me by all means. He's now uh, heading towards the the bushes again, where there is a dry riverbed. Yeah, now we can go to Steve, and then I will still go and follow Tingana and see if there will be any other interesting development. Good luck, Sydney. I hope you managed to keep up with the Duke. We have left Tandy and Tlalamba all to themselves with their, st or should I say, a party for three. The third member is not doing too much, just lying there very limply, the Stenbock. I'm sure she was lots of fun earlier, but uh, we, have, we have got a nice view now of the sun has set, beautiful clouds on the horizon. And this is the calm before the storm. It's going to be very cold tonight with this cloud dissipating. But I don't mind when it's beautiful like this. It can be as cold as it needs to be. This morning was lovely. I didn't have nearly as many layers as I needed to. Beautiful oranges. Some moments to contemplate your day mm. oh, Laura Moore, the color reminds you of sherbet ice cream well pinky sherbet ice cream I've never heard of that flavor we're not very imaginative in South Africa when it comes to ice creams I think it's growing I saw a place not long ago that offered 41 different flavors of milkshake. I was quite excited about that. 
but I saw it on my way out. I didn't get to stop. That is beautiful, beautiful African evening. We always wonder, what are the animals thinking when they see that sort of view? Are they enjoying it like we are? Or are they going, uh oh, it's going to get dark very soon. And looking around, yeah, Lou's agreeing, they're probably hoping they don't get eaten. For a leopard and a lion, though, this becomes their favorite part of the day. Nice and cool, beautiful afternoon, going into an evening, they've had a nice sleep. Time to, to look for some food. Look at that, Darby, much better than my face, surely. <laughs> Peter Viper, what a fantastic question. You want to know what three best lessons we can learn from animals? Well, number one is definitely to live in the moment. Animals go moment by moment. They don't seem to, to think too far ahead, and they don't seem to mourn or think too far back. It's hard to really know what goes on in their mind, but they are constantly living in the present. How many times do you find yourself getting preoccupied, preoccupied with the TV or with a task or with your cell phone and completely forgetting what's going on around you and I see it all the time when we're down down at a beach or down where there's a beautiful view and you've got someone sitting there playing on their phone when there's something like this unfolding in front of you I think that's the important thing uh, another one is to to just take it all in it goes back to um, Back, take in your surroundings and the environment. Increase your senses, your hearing, your smell. goes back to the last point I spoke about. You'll quite often get views like this, and I've had it many times with guests in the past, and you can't, people can't put their cameras down. They have to keep taking photos after photos after photos, and these days it's all about selfies. But you miss, you can't capture this. It's impossible to capture the sound, the smell, and the vastness of this horizon. I've tried. I stopped taking lots of photos of horizons a long time ago because it really doesn't... You look at it late, you're like, okay, well, that was all right. And the camera, we can pan and we can pick up the audio as well. It can bring you this all the way back home. So I think those are two very important lessons. I'm trying to think of a third one, Peter Viper. But for all of you out there, contemplate your day. Looking at a view like this, have you achieved what you wanted to? What does tomorrow look like? But don't forget that this is the only moment that you have. It is the present, and therefore a gift. Don't let it pass you by. We, life is just full of moments. Only moments. Are you angry with someone? Are you upset about something? Let it go another day. Have a deep breath. Hmm. And then I think the last one would be, I mean I don't know if animals do do it, but they do certainly breathe a lot. We saw it with Osana yesterday. After all his breathing, <laughs> sniffing out that uh, whatever it was he was looking for, we never found it, but it cooled his nose down. I think we need to all remember to breathe more. Deep breaths, deep breaths in, deep breaths out. Those are three very simple things I think the animals do all the time that we take it, we take for granted and we can do them wherever we are. Do them wherever we are, in any moment, at any time. Doesn't matter who we're looking at or what we're doing, even if it is the Duke Tingana himself. Let's go see what he's smelling on the ground. Yeah, I think Anna is uh, right here with me, but it's just ahead of me behind the bushes. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to drive and see if we can have a, a sighting. We are going to see him just now. It won't take long until I find him because he's, 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 he's right somewhere here, somewhere in front. So I'm now just entering the drainage. So 
Well, I can see that now Tingana is uh, on the road. You can see his right walking in front of me. Still very relaxed and it has been quite a very long distance. I think uh, I might have been following him for the past uh, yeah, couple of kilometers. So I've been following him for the couple of kilometers now. So, but still he's heading towards Twins Dam, that area. Maybe he's got some other plans going to take place in that area. Uh, Tingana is not uh, hunting at the stage. What I have seen is that Tingana is just going around marking his territory. It's normal. He's just patrolling and try to renew the scent. Remember, uh, animals, they communicate, make use of different ways. And one of them is scent markings. He's just trying to alert all the other males in the area that this is still his area and it belongs to him. Let me just try and follow him so that I don't lose him. It is very much quiet here where I am. No other activities are taking place. It's just Tingana walking around. Maybe other animals already left the area when the impalas and the monkeys were giving some alarm calls. Uh, Tingala is camouflaged somewhere here in the area. Oh, there he is. I saw him now. We'll see him just now. Still going down the drainage line. Oh, I saw him just now, but now I can't see him anymore. But he's somewhere here. Yeah. There you see now. Uh, I can see him, but it's not a very good sighting from where I am. But I think from now we're going to have a better sighting here. So here I'm going to have to show you how beautiful Tingana is. Quite a beautiful animal. It's trying to pay attention to something. I can hear I didn't get the question from Philip uh, very nicely. If you can uh, bring back that question. Yeah, the adult leopard, commonly they die of hunger because when they are growing old, they lose the teeth. And once the teeth are worn, it means it won't be easy for that animal to be able to eat. So that is what kills the lepers the most. They don't have quite a lot of enemies. I can hear he's now concentrating on something. I can hear branch breaking in this area. It seems like there's one of the big mammals here, not far away. Too much noise from the bushes. Yeah, there's a lot of noise coming from. So now uh, we can go to Steve and hear what Steve is going to tell us from his side.
Well, I'm just going to be heading on back home. It's been a marvellous afternoon. We've really enjoyed ourselves. Bumper to bumper with animals from every side. I'm sure you, the viewers at home, have been thrilled and on the edge of your seat watching lions hunting buffalo, even though they didn't catch anything. It's so exciting. I managed to quickly turn over onto my phone to just catch the excitement in James's voice as he was uh, voicing the end of that chase. And then I think you were coming back to us, so I quickly had to turn my phone off. <laughs> but that was really, really cool. That's one thing I miss. Um, the guiding time life, we spend a lot of time with lion. A lot of time with lion hunting. And we don't spend as much time here with them doing their thing as I'd like to, to be honest. So now that the dry season is fully underway, um, my uh, suggestion that the buffalo are going to slowly be coming back in for kind of down in the drainage here. You can't really see it here, but where we came through in the drainage, there's lots of grass in the drainage line. That, uh, that's what the buffalo are going to be coming through. Uh, it's quite nutrient rich buffalo grass, white buffalo grass. And uh, hopefully we get a few more of them coming through and that will attract the lions. So as we've seen, we seem to sort of call it every time we see a buffalo coming in. We come in, we see a buffalo and then lions arrive. It is just the way it goes. Yes, you're all commenting on how action packed it is. I think we've all been thoroughly spoiled today, even from our side. We, sit out here and we bring this to you so we thoroughly enjoy it ourselves don't you Davi? what did you do this afternoon well we found elephants and we spent some time with the hippo and then well we we looked at a leopard and a cub for some time and then we went home <sighs> terrible terrible i'm going to be having a phone call with some of my friends later who've been in johannesburg and been working hard at the grindstone and i'm pretty sure their day's description is going to be slightly different to mine just a little bit I can actually put money on it. <laughs> yeah, a very different lifestyle, but then we do choose it. We do choose it. But from uh, Davi and myself, it has been marvelous and wonderful having you on board this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. And from our side, we'll see you in the morning. And let's go back over to Sydney and the Duke. Tingana is very much relaxed at the moment. But I can see that the uh, way is he is surrounded by a lot of big animals. The branches are just breaking everywhere. It seems like we have got some elephants here. They are not trumpeting. All they are doing is just breaking branches. Look at those eyes. These animals can see very well. Eh? and those whiskers. They use those whiskers in order to judge the space in between the trees. You can see now it's moving away in order to give these elephants chance because it seems like the elephants are coming his direction. Look at that. So I'm just gonna try and follow Tingana a little bit and see where he's gonna come out. So you can see now Tingana is uh, uh, Tingana is now going down. It's right now on the drainage line. Tingana made my day today. I love leopards. And thank you very, very much for all your questions and comments. Let's meet again tomorrow at half past six in the morning. He's still walking, Tingana. Can 
look at the, uh, the animal disappearing. So Tingana's disappearance is bringing us to the end of the show. And I, I would like to say thank you very much again for all your participants. Thank you for your questions and comments. Let's meet again tomorrow at half past six.